Um, but it's just that pressure of, you know, the parents would rather, you know, not bother their kids. And I guess in a way that is a, because they love them yeah. and they don't want to interrupt their life and they don't want to interrupt, you know, what the parents work so hard, you know, in, in terms of raising their kids. They, didn't, they don't want to mess that up. And so they feel like it's just better for them to take their life. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Happy Project podcast. My name is Becky. Sitting next to me is Cedric Sky City, and we're here once again on the podcasting couch to bring with us some information, conversation, and declarations of healthy mental habits. Yes. <laughs> Trying to find something to continually rhyme. Yeah, that was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, first off, how are you? Me, I am doing okay. Uh, it's been a long day today because I was mm. out shooting mm -hmm. all day and then coming back home, I wanted to get a workout in. And, you know, getting my workouts is a good way for me to relieve stress. And uh, it was quite stressful tonight, though, because it was so packed. So I think it was kind of counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So I came home, ate dinner, and, uh, you know, now we're podcasting. So yeah. I think, yeah, today was an okay day. You know what I think it is? This just hit me. I think that we're having the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. And so probably some of you guys have seen on the news in South Korea right now, we're having unprecedented flooding. I think the amount of flooding this big has only happened in 2011 during the monsoon season. So this season, we're having just so much rain that the Han River overflew. Overflow. <laughs> Overflow. <laughs> um, overflowed overflowed yeah. overflooded um there's a lot of water and so it's actually almost reached the highway that was yesterday i think so you can see some photos and it looks very alarming honestly um and so we're having some traffic difficulties getting around the weather's been very very gloomy always carry your umbrella everywhere and if you're not careful a passerby car will splash you with water so it's just this general feeling of just being drenched. Yeah, and I got splashed by the bus yesterday, by the way. Did you? Luckily, I was in my gym clothes. So I was like, ah, I'm about to take a shower anyway, ah. but I did. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not what we're going to talk about. But, you know, in a way, I think it is kind of related because weather really affects your mood, mm -hmm. right? And uh, this was actually a topic I'd been considering for some time, and that's the, the case of mental health and... Um, therapy, counseling, the things that go together with being healthy mentally. And you might know if you yourself are from an Asian family or you have ties to Asian countries, regardless where that is, because it seems to be not really across the map, honestly. Um, I would say primarily like Japan and Korea are the ones who get the most publicity for uh, having a lot of mental health stigmas. China and India as well, actually. Mm -hmm. China and India uh, oh, man, yeah. also seem to have some taboos and stigmas against mental health. And so Korea is um, carries, unfortunately, a very... Um, I don't, and it's it's not a great ranking in the world, but having a very... One of the highest percentages of suicides mm -hmm. of the in this country. And Japan also is uh has a very high rate as well and so the topic of mental health is just it's so huge um and it's also very heavy that today we're just gonna break it down and we're gonna focus primarily on suicides now that term itself might be a trigger to some people who are listening to this so we want to give you a heads up that we will be using the term suicide however we are not going to be getting graphic by any means so this is a trigger warning but also letting you know we're not going to go beyond anything pg the second thing is that neither of us are you know licensed health uh, counselors mm -hmm. or psychiatrists right. or anything like that we're more observers in this case and also talking through our own experiences and what we've seen in our own societies so uh, we'll be coming more from that angle so if you do need any actual medical help as you're listening to this, you think maybe I should get some medical help. We are not the right people to reach out. And I will offer some links and some phone numbers that you can reach out to, whether you are, whether it's an international number or if you're in Korea. So these are just kind of my PSAs I wanted to throw out before we start. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Great. We do care. But yes, we want to leave uh, 
that in the hands of the professionals. Yeah, of course. But it is it is good to also note that we are here and listening. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to make like, um, I would say a very warm and, and open place where we can discuss these things. Because like I mentioned before, mental illness has been traditionally a taboo in Korea. And like I said, we're going to focus primarily on Korea in this case. That's where we are right now. And it has recently been in the news with the uh, the recent suicide of the mayor of Seoul. Right. Right. And so uh, we'll get on that in just a bit. But it's kind of rocked the nation and for many reasons. But before we actually get into that one, I thought we might just give a brief overview on what might be some reasons someone would want to attempt suicide. Yeah, I mean, there are probably countless number of reasons, mm-hmm. big and small, or a combination of them. So obviously, there isn't one reason that is the reason for everyone. Yeah, there's no defining know? factor. Um, but I would say uh, one just out of just pulling it out of a hat is uh, just the pressures from society. Mm-hmm. Whether it is in the West or in the East, and there are different types of pressure. Of course, living here in Korea, there is a certain type of societal pressure uh, that comes from not only uh, the economic standpoint of you know your status, but also from really just the cultural standpoint. Yeah, yeah, and just the values of the culture. And there's a lot of pressure for people to be a certain way. For example, a big one is for women in Korea. A lot of women in Korea. Uh, They have this pressure that a lot of guys don't have. A lot of males do not have. And that's that pressure to you have to be married by a certain age and you have to be pretty much wifey material. Yeah. You You know, don't let your career get in the way. Right. And if you, you know, I think Korea has progressed enough to where, okay, it's cool. As a woman, you can have your career. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, when it's time to have a baby, you know, that's another story. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's I, I think that's cause a great deal of stress and obviously a lot of pressure for a lot of the the women here and i've heard it time and time again i've only been here two years uh, a little over two years now and uh, i've heard it already from so many different women the same sort of narrative the same sort of story whether it's through friends or acquaintances about that pressure and how they feel Mm -hmm. yeah and so i think a lot of times that can lead people or be a big factor in people wanting to just take their life because they feel like they can never they can never live up to those expectations mm-hmm. or they don't even want to live up to those expectations but if society deems me invaluable because i don't want to fulfill those expectations then what's the point of me being here mm-hmm. you know so yeah. i think that is one out of many yeah you're totally right about being many factors to this because it seems to be so incredibly varied i mean a commonly linked factor to uh attempted suicides is depression you know mm-hmm. a lot of times that's going to be something that's very common um when you look at suicide cases but beyond that there's there's just so many reasons that might lead to someone trying to attempt suicide. And so I was trying to pull up some uh, stats or data or research on this, you know, because I'm sure that there are people who have studied this. And of course, they have. Um, But it can come down to many, many things. Like you, of course, would have depression. There could also be trauma. This was something that I found interesting that actually people who have suffered traumatic experiences like war or abuse or something that happened in their childhood have a higher likelihood to uh, committing suicide later on in life. Mm. So that was one thing, Uh, a mental illness, right? If you might feel like you're just not in control of yourself or your own emotions and that's overwhelming, that could be something. Uh, A feeling of helplessness or hopelessness, substance abuse that can cause impulsive behavior. Something I found interesting was that more often than not, a suicide attempt is impulsive. It's Mm. not really planned out. So um, having some kind of substance abuse might cause you to be more impulsive. Now, this was the thing that I feel related very closely to what you were saying about Korea was a fear of um, this societal pressure, fear of loss, as in like I lose my social status Mm -hmm. and it's a very public downfall. That's something um, I feel is is really detrimental in Korean culture or just Asian culture in general, like keeping face. Right. So if you're going to have a big social status loss um, or finances, personal academic failure, or people would rather commit suicide than going to prison 
these are some of the the reasons why someone might feel inclined to commit suicide and it seems in every country it's a little bit different because i think it's linked very highly to how your social network is how you feel personally and then how you are accepted or taken care of right right so um coming on over to korea then what is causing Korea to always be in the top 10 of countries with the highest suicide rates? In 2018, they were top four. I think even in 2020, we're still number four. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is specifically in the elderly populations, over 60, and teens, like 10 to age 10 to maybe late 20s. Right. Has a really high percentage comparatively to the rest of the populations. And what might be some reasons for that? Right. Man, you know, this is me just, uh, if I can somewhat speculate based off of my experiences and what I know, um, you know, for the younger, uh, you know, maybe the, the kids, the preteens, it's, it's, I mean, you name it, it can be the pressure to do well academically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and all the way through high school, you have the big major Korean version of the SAT, their standardized test called the Sinung. Yeah. And this is sort of like your lifeline to get into a good school and can potentially set you up for the rest of your life in Korean society. And that's a once in a year type of test. Whereas uh, if you don't do well, you're sort of set with that score unless you want to retake it the next year. But even that's a lot of pressure. It's like a whole year or two of just study. Exactly. And so, you know, some people, I mean, it's so competitive because you're competing with your fellow peers and not everyone is going to be able to get into the top school. So, I mean, you have that sort of pressure. Maybe the younger age, you have the pressure of beauty. Beauty standards Mm -hmm. is huge, especially with me uh, having taught my first year in Korea, uh, elementary middle school age i noticed that within the girls especially more than i've noticed in the west it's just this this obsession with beauty and looking good and pretty and makeup and comparing themselves to their the k-pop idols and just this unrealistic beauty standard Mm -hmm. so i think that is a big pressure with this just briefly with the the celebrities in comparison with the k-pop idols we are going to talk about a few well-known cases in a bit but they found that there were actually some surges in suicide attempts after a celebrity commits suicide. Right. And this has to do with the Korean fandom culture. I think that there's this almost like obsession with what are these people doing, especially with women, female K-pop idols particularly. What do they look like? What's their personal life like? Oh my gosh, who are they dating? And on top of that is almost like, um, it's, it's a weird shaming, blaming game that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, the Korean netizens and Korean fan them is well known to actually have some very toxic parts not everyone of course but some toxic aspects of their culture so to kind of give a comparison to in the u.s versus in korea there was this uh, recently a k-pop idol who he came out saying that his girlfriend whom had been previously rather kept secret was pregnant and so he was stepping away from the k-pop idol group to take care of his child In the U.S., if you looked online and and how people were reacting to that, it was like, good for him. He's standing up. He's Hmm, going to be a dad. We're proud of you. That's right. You should take care of your personal life. And then Korean netizens were saying, how dare you? You are betraying us. You're betraying your team. You were being irresponsible. How come we didn't know about her in the first place? You're not supposed to be dating somebody. And so you can see the reaction overall was extremely different. Right. And I think that contributes a lot to this intense pressure. Uh, celebrities and k-pop idols in particular feel right uh it's it's crazy i mean the k-pop idols feel that pressure and then the their their fans feel almost this equal type of like opposite sort of pressure you know and so yeah that's a big part with the young people and you know with the older age uh you know a lot of it has to do and this really breaks my heart because you know as i was uh just preparing for this episode and just hearing stories of why the older generation uh, would take their lives because that was that was that was more of a new newer revelation for mm-hmm. me but i totally understand why it's because the dynamics of i guess the family and the generations have changed over the years whereas yeah. uh, the family the family was a bit more uh, i guess nuclear was mm-hmm. is the better term like 
before they would have like the the parents and the kids but then also grandma sure uh, all living together everyone's yeah living together a family they're supporting each other and of course like the the parents once you get to a certain age uh usually the the child would or their you know eldest or whoever is agreed uh to do this they'll take care of you know the parents Mm -hmm. and then now you come you fast forward a generation or two it's kind of shifted away from that to where right. it's i guess it's a little bit more like western style whereas you're somewhat on your own you know if you're a parent and i think a lot of people when they get to that elderly age they don't have that support system yeah right and you know maybe they feel like they would be a burden hmm. to their kids mm-hmm. and so i mean it, i'm not blaming the kids i'm not blaming the parents i mean there's there's different variables in this um but it's just that pressure of you know the parents would rather you know not bother their kids and i guess in a way that is because they love them yeah and they don't want to interrupt their life and they don't want to interrupt you know what the parents work so hard you know in in terms of raising their kids they didn't they don't want to mess that up and so they feel like it's just better for them to take their life yeah this is very hard to wrap my head around because there's this uh, traditionally Korean society and families have this kind of filial, 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 <laughs> filial obligation. The child is supposed to take care of the parent as they get older. So that's, that's one thing. This filial obligation was kind of implicit, right? Parents would expect, once I'm older and can take care of myself, my child would take care of me. So that was happening. Two, at the same time, there was no social safety net. The government has no social safety net in place for elderly people who might not have any children. So um, maybe in other countries, there's what, social security or some kind of, I'm not entirely sure, but like some welfare system maybe, Mm -hmm. even if that's not the term you use, but something social safety, protection, help for elderly people. In Korea, that doesn't exist because they expected the family to take care of the children. But then now we had like, say the huge economic downturn that happened in the late nineties. And so of course people couldn't even support themselves. How are they supposed to support their parents? And so these parents who in their prime had sacrificed so much for their children and family, now that they're old, had nothing to offer to their their children because here's another thing mm. discrimination against mm-hmm. elderly workers people who are over 60 in korea have a huge difficulty finding new jobs it's very hard for them to get hired because there's a discrimination right. against it's kind of ageism right it's against elderly people so all of these factors combined caused with um then the, the parents feeling like well i can't support my family now i can't get a job and I worked so hard for them to have a good life. Why should I saddle myself on them? And um, also the mindset has changed a bit. They're not supposed to take care of me, I guess. They don't want to do, they want to live their own life, take care of their own family. So in a way it's self-sacrificial for elderly people to just commit suicide instead because they don't want to burden their family or their society. And uh, we see that there's a higher rate because in Korea about half or over half of the elderly population is living under the poverty line and a big percentage of them are living in rural areas. So they don't have somebody to check in on them all the time. Their kids have moved to the city for better work. So they're alone a lot. So all of these are contributing factors for a high elderly suicide rate in South Korea. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to make a quick correction because I mentioned nuclear family, which is actually just the the family unit of traditionally the mom, dad, and just the kids. The, oh, okay. Yeah, the direct uh-huh. unit. And then the extended family would be the grandpa, the grandmother, yeah. maybe aunts, uncles, things like that. So I yeah. just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's a big part. You know, I, I want to share a personal story. Like me being the first son, mm-hmm. uh, I've always sort of felt this responsibility to take care of my mom. Yeah. You know, once she gets at a certain age where uh, maybe, you know, she's not as independent or even if she was independent, I still wanted to be the one to take care of her, to provide for her. And I think for me, it's because I saw in the States, now my father had passed away about 10 years ago. And so my mom, uh, you know, she she just, she lives with my sister right now, but I've always felt like I wanted to be the one to take care of her uh, because I saw my mom do that with her mother. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother, uh, 
uh, my mom's mom actually lived with us and when when she got to a point where she couldn't really take care of herself my mom really did everything Mm -hmm. and so i i told myself you know what i want to do that one day for her and for me it's no question about it you know uh but i can i guess i can understand how the system is here and the economics of today's time here in Korea because now it's more about just getting ahead and doing whatever you got to do and sacrificing for your immediate family. And it's sort of like, well, we don't really have the space or the energy or the capacity or the the resources to support beyond that because we're barely making yeah. ends meet ourselves. Yeah. So I can I can see that, but <clears throat> man, it's it's such a sad thing for me. It is know? a sad thing. Um yeah, looking at it from that perspective, because I mean, look at us, like I can't even imagine myself trying to, regardless, having my own child and taking care of a kid at this time, plus having to take care of my parents. And so not to say I don't want to, but it, it is true that you feel stretched or it can mm-hmm. be really hard. And when the society or community around you is not helping you in any way or providing you in any resources, it's it can you can feel a burden on yourself and i imagine also parents would feel a burden like why did i work so hard for you to just struggle longer mm. because of me yeah so it is not a healthy mindset whatsoever but that is the unfortunate reality of what's happening in korea and we can see that reflected in the higher suicide rates so we already touched briefly on um younger kids as well teenagers and students primarily Part of that is the extreme competition. There's so much competition here. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned the exam that so much hinges on passing that test well and getting into a good school. Then you have academic pressures from your parents, right? Because it was always study, 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 study. 공부해야, then you can succeed, right? So this, this mindset is so prevalent that sometimes you can feel trapped or hopeless. To kind of put it in perspective, sometimes students here will be studying attending school or after school academy and studying on their own for 16 hours a day yeah that's that's what no they do exaggeration for all of their school years right and so it's no wonder you can feel quite pressured and depressed so in, in order to release this steam a lot of students then what will drink or mm-hmm. smoke with their friends even starting from a young age that can easily spiral out of control right you know so and internet addiction is also another thing because we have PC buying here all the time. And of course, don't mistake us by saying doing internet correlates to having high suicide rates. That's not exactly, you can't jump the gun like that. Mm-hmm. But we have seen there are studies that will say this is a possible factor or this could also be something that can lead to something that makes you want to something, something, something. So all of these correlating things. Now I wanted to talk about um, some well-known suicide cases that happened in Korea. And I feel like they will highlight some of these cultural aspects that we have touched upon. So um, the first one I wanted to bring up was the Lotte Vice Chairman, Lee Mm In-won, in 2016. Did you ever hear about this one? I I think so, but you might have to refresh my memory. Yeah. So apparently he was about to head off to an afternoon meeting with, uh, I guess... Who the police? Okay, the police were basically doing an investigation on him and Lotte and why there was some some sign of corruption going on and mm-hmm. their weird finances. And instead of going and facing that meeting, and perhaps now we see releasing the corruption that was happening behind the closed doors, he chose to commit suicide instead. So on one hand, from maybe a Western point of view, you would look at that and say, what a cowardly behavior, mm-hmm. right? How could you have done that? But maybe from a more Asian point of view or Korean standard, it's he was saving face. Right. How could he go to prison for his mistakes, right? In a way, it's kind of, in a way, protecting himself, mm-hmm. right? So it, it kind of you can kind of see why saving face is so important and this fall from high status is so incredibly shameful that people would literally choose to die than face that themselves. Right. Right? That was one case I thought might kind of shed a little bit light there. Yeah, that's a very good example of uh, just, I guess, the, the shame-based nature of Korean society. Yeah. Because, you know, if he stuck it through... And he obviously knew that he had something to hide that, you know, eventually 
what he did in the darkness was going to come out to light. He knew that there would be an incredible amount of shame that he probably just, he just couldn't handle. Mm -hmm. So he had that foresight to know that it's better for me to just not be here. It's the easier route in a sense, you know? Well, some people might say that, right? I feel like that I don't want to get too much into that because I feel like, um, I don't want to give anyone an excuse or reason for why they might feel it's okay to commit suicide to say it's Mm -hmm. the easy way, easy way out. Um, but you, you are right that in this case he may have been thinking that, you know, right. Um, I mean, we, we ultimately don't know. We don't know his true reasons. Yeah. We, we can never know. Another one was in 2017. Shiny. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know what happened here? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I know vaguely, I know it was huge news because Shiny was one of the biggest, like second generation K-pop idol, yeah. uh, boy groups. And, uh, yeah, I used to listen to their stuff oh, yeah? and that's a big statement cause I, I barely listen to yeah, any you like never guy listen groups. To guy groups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is like years ago. Uh-huh. Um, and, and so I remember when it happened, that was before I came to Korea. Oh, right. It would have been right before you came. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I remember, I mean, he wasn't the first on the celebrity status, Mm -hmm. but I think that was the biggest one that I could remember in recent years. Well, yeah. So Kim Jong-un from Hyun from Shiny. Sorry, I butchered the name. (laughs) So Kim Jong-un from Shiny. Mm -hmm. He was one of their vocalists and uh, it appears that he had committed suicide due to feeling very depressed. So he had apparently a lot of depression and he left a note behind saying like he hated himself, things like that. And also a note claiming that his doctor blamed his personality, blamed his personality for his depression. Is his doctor or was it uh, like his therapist? I think he was was it a therapist. It might have been. Yeah. Or it could have been a doctor, but I think it might have been a therapist. (laughs) This kind of blows my mind. Basically saying your personality is bad. That's why you're depressed. Like, it's your fault for your Mm -hmm. depression. What a horrific statement. We're not going to get too much into mental health scene here in Korea. We'll get into that in some future episodes. We are planning on discussing this further um, on a wider range, but it's just too much to handle right now. But you can see already just in that, that mental health is something of a taboo here. Again, you got to find someone to blame. Instead of saying like, oh, well, actually, maybe you just need some treatment or why don't you just get some proper therapy? It's so much easier to shuffle it under the rug and mm-hmm. being like, oh, there's something wrong with your personality. Yeah. That's why you're depressed. So you need to fix that. Right. So this, I feel like, highlighted that aspect in this case. Right. Now, that was already very recent. 2017. That's not so long ago. And yet that um, the passing of Kim Jong-un was already overshadowed by yet another celebrity suicide mm-hmm. uh Sully from fx right do you remember that yeah that i do remember this one really shocked i think a lot of people mm-hmm. but here's the crazy thing she wasn't the first to have um they, they blame the suicide because of bullying online right bullying. right that was the story around that yeah cyber bullying was so incredibly intense and she faced so much hate online and um when when her suicide was pronounced like it happened so many people were blaming the cyber bullying like mm-hmm. oh you made this happen you guys were the ones who killed her and uh, the crazy thing is cyber bullying is a it's an old story in korea and i have a feeling that nothing changed after this mm-hmm. what happened nothing so, I mean, were there any laws put in place? Is there any way to prevent people leaving anonymous hateful comments that actually have an impact on somebody? No. And so we still see that in Korea. And like we mentioned earlier, you know, there, netizens and fandoms can get really dangerous and toxic. And I think sometimes they feel like they own their idol, right. their celebrity, and forget that they're a real living human being who reads what you say and internalizes that and if there's no way to get that out in a healthy manner here in korea and then you feel this intense pressure sometimes people feel trapped or feel like this is the only option right we can't speak for these celebrities or how they're feeling but one thing we can say is that we read youtube comments that are hateful Mm -hmm. i know those hurt my feelings right can you imagine if you're getting this on a nationwide scale right not only that but like i mean we read hurtful or hateful comments but they're a small percentage of what we read whereas some of these celebrities especially someone in maybe like Tully's 
uh, situation, she might like percentage wise, more of what she reads is not only on a bigger scale, but it's just more, Mm -hmm. you know, so she's just constantly, you know, if you're constantly just reading this and hearing this, I mean, man, like I can only imagine how much that will eventually get to you. Yeah, it would take a very strong individual to be able to withstand all that and be like, oh, who cares? That doesn't bother me. It's, it's very hard to accept criticisms like that, mm-hmm. and especially when it's coming nonstop and about things that maybe you can't even control. So, um, you know, this is just a word out for people who like to troll and leave mean comments on videos and stuff. There's not really any necessary for that necessity for that. Obviously, me saying that is not going to stop you from doing it <laughs> if you wanted to leave mean comments. Yeah. But it's just a reminder that we're humans too. Yeah, it's just it's just the, you know, this is a for another day another time, but it's just the fact that there's no accountability there for the right. internet trolls, you know. Right, right. They they know that no one knows who they are really and yeah. they can hide behind the keyboard. We call them internet thugs. Oh know, yeah? Like, yeah, it's just Oh, I never heard that. Yeah, they they're so hardcore behind the keyboard, <laughs> but like, you know, face to face, most people wouldn't go that far. Yeah. If you can't say it to someone in person, maybe you just shouldn't say it even yeah. online. Yeah, but that's beyond. That's the another scope topic. Of today, yeah. yeah. So that was October 2019 with Holly, mm-hmm. and that that shook me more than any of the other stories I had read. Yeah, and I, I I think it was her, but I think she left a like her final Instagram post as well. That was so. Yeah, sad. I remember reading that, and that that's what got me. Yeah, and it's just like I think it was maybe the day before. It was the night before, like and it was just her laying, and mm-hmm. it said like mm-hmm. "Tarja," I think, mm-hmm. like "Good night." That was so heartbreaking because no one thinks that's going to be your final words. Like no one would think it's such innocent things to say. So you never, 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 never know what a person is going through. And I just really, really want to emphasize that. You never, never know. Now there's another case I wanted to bring up in uh, this. This was uh, the mayor, the sole mayor. Right. Super recent. This is. Last couple weeks. This was literally like two weeks ago. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, wasn't it like June 2020? Yeah, it was last month, wasn't it? Yeah. Or maybe in June, yeah. Yeah. So this one, Pak Won Soon, he was the celebrated Seoul mayor. He um, obviously was here to help our city get through uh, the virus when it first broke out. Right. And he was doing a great job. Actually, a lot of people were praising him for the way he had been handling the outbreak. He was also a well-known advocate for women's rights, which is very unusual from a male politician in mm-hmm. South Korea. He was the lawyer to win, I think, the first uh, harassment case for a woman, so like protecting her. Mm, and he won okay. the case, so that was historic. Right. And he was always um, very... He was having a rather historic climb. You know, people thought actually he would be a presidential candidate Mm -hmm. for the upcoming election. So this was kind of where he was positioned politically and uh, in the social view, how people viewed him. Well, uh, his former secretary had stated she had she came public with a statement that he had harassed her over the past four years, uh, sexual harassment and so she felt like she finally had to bring this up to the light. Mm-hmm. Um, with this has to do with like the Me Too movements and all that. And the crazy thing is he was always very supportive of Me Too movement too. Right. You know, he was always saying like, yeah, this is great. Women should be able to speak out and not be afraid of that. So when the secretary made th- these accusations against him, obviously it went like wildfire. How this mayor who celebrated <laughs> women and women's rights, how could he be accused of something like this, right? So investigations were ongoing when the mayor disappeared apparently he had just left his phone and then just was gone and his daughter i believe noticed that he did not come back Uh, and then there was the search for the two days Mm -hmm. and then they found his body in the woods Um, and there was a note that he had left behind and so people say it was a suicide note because the investigations were going on for the sexual harassment allegations and he could not face the shame right or the fact that he would lose his position in power, mm-hmm. politically speaking. It's um, very difficult to wrap your mind around that, isn't it? Right. It seems to be a very similar story. You know, it's very similar to the uh, what, what happened with Lotte. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, we we find it, it is never okay that these 
situations happen. Never. Mm -hmm. However, if there is one good thing I can see, and by good, I really use that term in a, let's say, long-term beneficial way, like if you're looking foresight, long foresight, is that it reveals certain aspects of Korean culture that we perhaps or definitely need to address mm -hmm. so that we can prevent these sort of things happening in the future. Because the string of celebrity suicides, it's not an accident. And they always seem to be stemmed in very similar things over and over and over again here in Korea. So what is South Korea doing? about this have you um have you heard of any campaigns or anything south korea is trying to do to prevent suicides uh i have not to be honest with you it's not really like openly talked about right i'm sure that there are things happening behind the scenes that mm -hmm. i'm probably not aware of because of especially what's been happening the last recent mm -hmm. you know couple of years but yeah I'm, i'm not too sure did you find anything uh very very little Mm -hmm. um i know you had watched that video about the suicide watch yeah what was that because i actually didn't watch the thing I okay watch the so whole thing. so that's basically a uh, rescue unit um who the han river which is seoul's main river that splits the city um so they pretty much just they survey and they surveillance the the river not the whole river but a couple of bridges mainly mapo bridge mapo and, bridge that's right yeah And so apparently this is the bridge where a lot of people attempt to take their life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so what they do is they basically on their high-speed boats, uh, they'll sometimes they'll get a call or they'll get some sort of like alarm they telling them. They have distress um, booths placed all along the bridge. Actually, right. you can see it. Have you ever walked along that bridge with I've, me? I've never, no, I've never walked along the bridge. I used I've to only seen it. go on runs. I used to take oh, jogs okay. along that bridge because it's actually really close to us. Right. I used to take jogs along that bridge and they have little distress signal boxes. Mm -hmm. So if you feel distressed or like you might want to jump off, but you also want to get help, you can mm -hmm. call that and that that can I, i guess it calls this patrol uh, yeah it might or yeah because basically i think the concept behind that was if you talk to somebody before you make that sort of decision yeah statistically speaking you're likely not going to go through with it right you know not all the time but there's a good chance and there's also like writing along the bridge saying have you eaten yet yeah and just little soft reminders of you know maybe that something or mm -hmm. someone actually cares just to get you thinking as you're walking you know, contemplating your yes. last couple of seconds. And so this rescue unit, uh, man, they're, they're, they're incredible. You know, they, whenever they uh, get a call or get the alarm, they'll rush out to the location because there's CCTV, there's mm -hmm. uh, cameras everywhere. So they'll know where the location is and they'll either, hopefully if the, if the person is still on the bridge, they're going to try to talk them out of mm -hmm. it, but they're also down on the water prepared mm. to rescue them if they mm -hmm, jump. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in this particular video, that's a couple of years old now, but you would, you would see people jump from the actual bridge, wow. but you know, they're, they're surviving because the unit is there yeah. and they pull them from the water. And the, the heartbreaking thing is one of the lead, uh, I guess, members of the unit mentions Our job is much easier if they say, for example, if they jump, but then they want help. But a lot of times that's not the case. They jump and we try to help them, but they're still like, yeah. you know, resisting or they don't want to be helped. That's right. the hard. Those are the hard missions. Yes. But a lot of times they're able to to pull these mm -hmm. people out of the water. But, you know, obviously there are many times where they'll, you know, come across people who have already mm -hmm. unfortunately have taken their life. And they have to, you know, deal with them. Yeah. So, yeah, incredible rescue unit. And I believe they are uh, provided by the government, mm -hmm. I believe. And so, yeah, that's what they do day in and day out. Mm -hmm. That's their day job. Yeah. And night job. Yeah, I think um, it's great to hear that they have that patrol. I, I actually had no idea until I came across that video. I had found out, um, so, so in Korea, there are a lot of mental illness taboos. And a lot of times people who contemplate suicide have a treatable mental illness, some form of depression or just something, maybe a bipolar disorder, something that can be treated and cured. But because Korea is so resistant to talking about mental illnesses, a lot of these people don't get treated, which unfortunately results 
um, not always, but can result in a suicide attempt, sometimes mm -hmm. just as a cry for help, right? And uh, men are twice as likely than women, but women are more than twice and likely to attempt. Mm, Men are ones okay. who actually commit the suicide. Women are more likely to attempt. That's here in Korea. And they were saying 90% of suicide victims have a treatable condition. Mm -hmm. If only uh, families or friends or people in power would acknowledge that mental illness is a serious thing that that can be taken care of here but it still remains a widespread taboo and we can talk about that more in a future episode particularly why do uh i found lots of info on why asian americans are so resistant to treatment mm -hmm. and we can get into that in a future episode but we can see that in korea as well this is a real a real serious thing and um, these suicide attempts could hugely be prevented this is why they were saying preventative is very 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 important so right. things like the signs on the bridge actually you can see that if you go walking along on the bridges not all of them mm -hmm. but some of the main ones um i used to see that all the time there's one bridge i used to walk across and they have like beautiful paintings and drawings mm -hmm. and right. uh they will they will say things like oh have you thought about your family today oh did you call your friend yet see how she's doing like little things like that and i remember the first time i saw that like how nice that they're mentioning but it gives you a weird feeling when you also see like the distress signal boxes there um and then like like they're trying to encourage you not to jump right but on one hand i am happy that they at least have that going on sure uh before i offer a couple of resources for people who might feel like they themselves are contemplating this or they know somebody or feel like somebody might need help before i give those resources is there anything else that you wanted to add I will say this, uh, and this is coming from a place of maybe hope, mm -hmm. you know, for the future, um, starting with the present and just making steps forward here in not only Korea, but really throughout the world. Uh, but specifically here in Korea, my hope is not only do we find ways to not only recognize, but to begin to treat mental illness or mm -hmm. mental uh health issues and to really put a focus on that through research through practice through providing resources for people but that is only part of the problem hmm. i think the other part are the external external things that you know can contribute to that and that is a whole nother can really because that's more of a systemic thing that i think over time needs to be reevaluated you know and just some of the i guess values that uh, traditionally Asian cultures tend to have with the shame uh, based I guess societies mm. and so I think in a perfect world if we can move towards reevaluating some of those values without losing the heart of the culture mm -hmm. I think that would serve the greater good so that would just be my hope yeah I love that you know, we get caught up, I think, in traditions. By the way, this is just me getting on my soapbox really fast. <laughs> I'll get off in a second. But we get caught up at the sense of tradition, right? We say, well, this is traditional. This is how we've always done it. This is tradition. Okay, but we know how you've always done it doesn't always mean that's the best way it could have been done. People used to feed their children opium because they thought that was <laughs> going to cure their cough. All right, maybe that's how it was done. But reevaluate, you can see that maybe there are better options out there. And I think we need to take a step back from uh, culture or traditions or feel like this is just the way it's always been done and really reevaluate. But is this the kind of society that we want to see in the future? And things change. Even culture and traditions can be flexible. Right. And so I think we can be part of that solution and be less afraid to talk about subjects that maybe previously were taboo. Mm -hmm. If you think this is going to be helpful, maybe it's going to save your life. Maybe it's going to save your friend's life. I will say, you know, don't take that lightly that maybe somebody is asking you for help and you need to pay attention to those things and don't be afraid to speak up. That being said, here are just a couple of resources for people who um, might feel that they need it. If you're in the U.S., there's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The number is 1-800-273-8255. There's also befrienders.org, B-B-E, friend, like F-R-I-E-N-D, E-R-S, befrienders.org. You can find more information and links there, and I believe that's international. And then for those who are primarily in Korea, because I know we have a lot of listeners here, if you're in Korea and you are feeling rather hopeless or you feel like 
there's nobody to talk to, they do have a couple of hotlines actually that are available that you can call. So there's the Chasar Yebang Sangdam, that's 1393. Chongshin Kongang, this is more like mental health. 1577-0199. Huimangi Chonwa, 129. And also, this is for uh, more of our younger listeners, Changsonyan for people who are maybe like teens or young 20s, 1388. So do not find an excuse for hiding how you are feeling if you're feeling very distressed. And you can call one of these numbers, and I'll also have it in the link below. So this was a bit of a heavy topic, and I hope that we could at least give it some justice without scaring people. Um, and you guys could realize our real heart about this. Yeah. So, Coco, anything else you wanted to say? No, I just want to say that I love everyone that's listening. <laughs> I've never met you, but Don't I love you. Don't make me emotional. I feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> no, really. You are you are valuable. You are special. Mm-hmm. And as cheesy as that may come across, it's true. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah. If no one said that to you, you can take it from us. And that's true. So, now is the time for George's Corner. Oh, wow. It's, it's been a while. It's been a while, guys. <laughs> but George is waiting patiently. So um, I thought I would just read you uh, an email that he had been describing to me what Hanamdong was like for him at the time when he was living there. So when he when he was on the Yongsan base, uh, what, what it was like in the surrounding area. Because as we know, it's changed drastically mm-hmm. since the 60s. So uh, let me tell you how he described it. Okay. Recently, you wrote that Hanamdong has probably changed so much since I lived there. Yes, over the years, Coco, a friend of his, from time to time has sent me pictures and Hanam looks nothing like it did when I was there. I served in the 570th or Kodas, oh gosh, this must be like military terms, I don't know, I'm so sorry. Uh, from the summer of 1958 until the summer of 1959, the village that surrounded the area to the north and I think the east was Hanamdong, the Han River was to the west about one fourth mile away. I'm not sure my directions are correct. Each morning when I would see the sun come up, it never did seem like the east to me. During 1958, the streets were a dark colored dirt. No paved streets. The small one room huts or houses as one would call them seemed to be made from something like a soft coarse cement. I think we still see some of that today. Mm -hmm. I really do not know what it was. I don't remember seeing any flowers, grass or trees. There was a small open front store only a few doors down from where Marie's room was located. Marie was the woman that he's still looking for today. We would sell goods that I would buy at the PX at the store for a nice profit. This was called working the quote unquote black market. (laughs) I know this sounds bad, but remember in 1958, things were so much different. And I did this to bring food to the village. So uh, the military personnel, the 570th, were ordered to never eat or drink anything off camp compound. There were no off-base restaurants or clubs or movies. So the place that you know as Itaewon, which was, that was off limits to them at the 570th personnel. Wow. They weren't allowed to go there. But Hanamdong was a safe place and remained on limits the entire time I was there. Uh, so he sent us a simple drawing of how he remembered the dirt streets. And every evening, he said, I looked out onto the street from Marie's window. I would see the farmers trudging along with vegetables that were on the A-frame. You know that the way that they would carry the wooden back. Um, And he was always dressed in that baggy white clothing. This is so strong in my mind today. Please forgive my poor use of words and please try and understand what I'm truly trying to tell you. Please write to me again, your friend George. So it kind of um, helps you to imagine a little bit what that must have been like. Right. It's very magical in a way. Yeah, it's hard to believe that it was so long ago, yet it wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't. Just how things change so quickly. Yeah. Well, if you ever have any questions for George, we know that he would love to hear from you. And by questions, we mean it could really be anything. Also, if you have more questions about his time in Korea, his personal opinions on certain things that maybe you are interested in, as in like the military or what it was like at Yongsan or Korea at that time or his relationship with Marie, we know that he would love to talk about these things. And he's always looking for somebody who's willing to just listen to the musings of an elderly man who had very remarkable experiences 
experiences. So that's it for George's Corner. And uh, we'll read listener mail next week. So if you guys ever have anything you'd like to say, you can write in at thehappyproject at gmail.com. So follow us on social media, The Happy Project. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you're listening to this podcast, well, you can listen to it anywhere. And you can also watch it on the YouTube channel when it comes out in video format. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We are The Happy Project.